What is going on guys and welcome back to the Sixers Digest YouTube channel. The NBA season is in full swing. We have hit the past the point of the season where we kind of have a feel for where each of these teams is stacking up and we are about 35 days remaining until the NBA trade deadline. So plenty of talks heating up for what is going on around the league, what the expectations are, who's turning to buyers, who's turning to sellers. And in this video here, I have to break down a couple new names that have entered the conversation regarding the Philadelphia 76ers, as well as a guy that I think is worth a look at from the Sixers perspective. Have taken some heat from this on Twitter already, but I do want to lay out my full reasoning why. So without further ado, let's get fully into anything. We we'll begin by kicking out a couple little nuggets from the recent article from Brett Siegel of Clutch Points. He dropped kind of a league notebook that talked about all his talking points with a bunch of different executives, and the Sixers came up a couple times in cross-reference. So I just wanted to point out a couple of these. Now, the first one here we have, and Siegel writes, quote, The Hawks, who previously offered a trade package centered around DeAndre Hunter and A.J. Griffin, remain fixated on the idea of pairing Siakam with all-star guard Trey Young. Along with the Hawks, the Indiana Pacers, Sacramento Kings, Philadelphia 76ers, and Dallas Mavericks expressed prior interest in Siakam, league sources said. Of the teams listed above, Atlanta remains the favorite destination. How the Hawks' pursuit of Siakam impacts the, their decision-making with former All-Star guard Jante Murray is a whole separate conversation. So not a new name here. We've, we've heard all the Pascal Siakam whispers. I've honestly heard more of it being settled down and pushed to the side, seeming less and less likely that that is the move for the Sixers. I understand the theoretical belief of Pascal Siakam or why he could be the missing piece on this team. You believe in the shot creation, and if you want to look at him in a vacuum, he's a far better basketball player than Tobias Harris. But I don't fully believe in the shot, and I do think there are some limitations. I also think that he's a, almost a caliber of player better than I think the Sixers should be interested in, that I think you start to run into a little bit of a, an alpha kind of situation that I've speaking pretty openly about. I love the setup of the current Sixers dynamic where it's very clear Joel Embiid is the alpha. He is the leader. He is the guy on this team. And then Tyrese Maxey is no coward by any means. He's not afraid of the moment, but he's willing to kind of defer to Embiid at times. I think that the Sixers have run into issues in past years when there's a little bit of the clashing behind the scenes. Maybe not behind the scenes or really clashing is the right word, but when there's a little doubt over whose this is. I think we saw that with James Harden. I think we saw that with Jimmy Butler, and we saw that with Ben Simmons all next to Joel Embiid. So now that Embiid is very clearly, this is his team, this is his organization, I kind of like it to stay that way. And I think Siakam does risk that balance a little bit, plus the fact that he will be a free agent this offseason or has the chance to be. So there is plenty of concern there as well. Now, a couple of the new names that I did want to get to, this one I thought was especially interesting, and he writes here, quote, however, the Pistons have interest in dealing sharpshooter shooter Joe Harris, who has played sparingly this season. The expectation is that the Pistons would receive one or two second-round picks for Harris. There are a handful of league executives also questioning whether or not the Pistons will show a willingness to discuss Cade Cunningham in trade talks. While it appears unlikely, Cunningham could return a slew of assets and would have various teams vying for his services. The Orlando Magic, San Antonio Spurs, Philadelphia 76ers, and Chicago Bulls are a few teams that come to mind that may search for ways to upgrade the talent in their backcourt. So this feels much more about reading between the lines than any sort of report. But we'll start with saying that the fact that the Pistons want to move on from Cade Cunningham, I think is very unlikely that as poor as the Pistons have played, it is as disappointing as this losing streak, the record all of the above has been. Cade Cunningham has been hooping that he is the real deal as a basketball player. And even a night like last night, he's putting up 35 points, controlling the glass, have, making an impact as a playmaker. He has a really nice polish to his game, gets to his spots really well, can defend good size. There's a lot to love about Cade Cunningham. And that would absolutely be the type of move that it would take every asset that the Sixers have remaining to make that happen. But he would be a long-term piece of the franchise if they believe in him. Now, if you hit me straight up and, and ask me what my full thoughts on this are. I just don't see any world where it happens, that I don't see the Pistons moving on from Cunningham, period. And I don't think the Sixers are the team with enough assets in the clip to be able to empty them and go get him if that was the case. So I do like the thought. I think Joe Harris is the more logical one there if there's any chance of that. And Joe Harris at a point in time was a very serviceable NBA player. He's been out of the rotation with the Pistons, and there's plenty of young talent that they're trying to develop. So you do have to understand that to a point. Uh, Harris has some limitations on the defensive side of the ball and just overall in his game as well. Not the perfect player, but a guy that I, I wouldn't be fully opposed to, but by far uh, not, not remotely a guy that I think moves the meter as far as getting the Sixers team over the championship hump. Now, I talked briefly about this guy yesterday, but I just wanted to mention it once again. And Siegel writes again, quote here, the same cannot be said for veteran guard Jordan Clarkson. 
Whether he starts or comes off the bench, Clarkson will be an instant upgrade for various playoff contending teams around the NBA. The Boston Celtics have shown prior interest in Clarkson, but it would be impossible for Boston to acquire the veteran unless they gave up either Derek White or Al Horford. The Philadelphia 76ers would be another intriguing landing spot for Clarkson, especially with D'Anthony Melton in the final year of his contract. I also don't like how Brett Siegel kind of portrayed this because Jordan Clarkson also in the last year of his contract and making a significant more than D'Anthony Melton, so it's not exactly the eye-for-eye eye comparison that I think he kind of wrote it out as. I do like Clarkson, and I think that the more I've digested this and thought on it, it appeals to me a little more than it did initially, that he has his flaws as a player as well. I like that he's kind of find his, found his identity as a true six-man, a microwave scorer, but he does do more than that, that he has grown as a playmaker, can rebound a little bit, has okay size. I can talk myself into Jordan Clarkson. That's not the end-all, be-all, or once again, my guy type of player. But I can kind of get the logic behind Jordan Clarkson. So I just wanted to bring up that comment again. Now, this is one that I was kind of digging through, looking at names, thinking of potential fits. And a guy that I have heard zero buzz about is Jonathan Isaac. So I'll begin with my initial tweet here. And as I mentioned already, that I've already taken plenty of heat for this. But I do think it's a conversation worth having. So I'll start with saying one personal Sixers trade target of mine would be Jonathan Isaac. Injury concerns are legit, but playing 13.6 minutes per game with the Magic uh, and with the Magic having a log jam likely makes him available. Six foot ten, 26 years old, has a two-year contract worth 34.8 million, uh, with the next season non-guaranteed. I love his defensive ability and feel like he could be a valuable, be valuable on a matchup-specific basis in the playoffs. Looking at his per 36 numbers on the year, and we'll touch on more of these, but 16.9 points, 10.9 rebounds, 3.3 blocks, and 2.2 steals. So obviously the per 36 numbers inflated the mindset behind that to kind of put it on the even playing field as a player that is starting or, or getting that amount of availability on the floor. Isaac, obviously, I think that would sink a little bit with the sample size. And to dive into fully to his stats here, we have, once again, 16.9 points, 10.9 rebounds, 2.3 steals, 3.3 blocks. You can see he's played 21 games this season. That is the most games that he has played since the 29-20 season. He had two seasons which he missed with an ACL tear. That is the biggest point against Isaac is these injury concerns. And believe me that they are very legitimate that this guy just frankly has not been on the basketball court very much at all. But when he has, he still has been effective. And this is a guy that... What, where I keep circling back to with the Sixers is I know all this talks and there's plenty of legitimacy to all these thought processes behind. They need more offensive firepower. They need another ball handler, all these things. When I sit back and think what will be the backbreaking piece of this team or what can they not find an answer to at this point, I still don't feel great about their options guarding the Jason Tatums, the Giannis Antetokounmpo, Jalen Brown, even these high-end wing players that the Sixers will just straight up have to get past to make a deep playoff run. And to me, Jonathan Isaac could be the solution to that, that he is a guy with real deal 6'10 size. He moves incredibly well, phenomenal hands, great athleticism, and I feel better about if we have one possession to go and we know the guy on him. I feel better about Jonathan Isaac being that guy than I do of any version of Tobias Harris, Nico Batum, even Robert Covington. And by the way, Isaac could play perfectly right next to Robert Covington on the floor, making that some sort of dynamic duo where there's hands everywhere, creating turnovers, all of the above. Now, why this especially makes sense to me and why I kind of landed on this name, for starters, this started while I was watching that double overtime game with the Magic versus the Kings last night. Awesome game. Palagone for, I think it was 43 points. But the Magic have quite a bit of log jam for their young players. That both the Magic and Thunder are an interesting spot as a franchise as they have an abundance of young talent. But now you have to make the decisions between who are you truly buying into, who are you believing in in the long term, and who are you willing to pay for their services moving forward. That you can't just give all these guys big-time contracts. That is the reason why there's a salary cap in the sport of basketball. So there's some tough decisions to be made. Now, with the Thunder, I think that the, the pieces and the young guys that they have built together just fit a little cleaner than is the case in Orlando. That I think that for the Magic, it's time to start figuring out the mix a little more. That there's obviously talent there. Franz Wagner is awesome. Paolo Bancaro is awesome. They got a ton of young guards with Cole Anthony, uh, with Anthony Black. The names go on and on for how many guys are just fun to watch on that team. But Jonathan Isaac is far from a core member of that team. And if you're looking for players to com complete this roster... I kind of think flipping a guy like him for maybe a Marcus Morris or a Robert Covington or a player like that that is a veteran presence is a solid role player. It makes sense for both sides. And with Isaac's contract, as I mentioned, two-year, $17.4 million with next year non-guaranteed whatsoever, that is something that will appeal to Daryl Morey, that he continues to just 
reinforce this concept of believing in this cap space plan that they're not willing to sacrifice future flexibility for getting a short-term player or committing to money in the long term for what would be a short-term impact. He wants to have all options on the table this summer. By trading for Jonathan Isaac, you keep that option available. And you know what? If he gets hurt in the first game in a Sixers uniform, if he's miserable having around the organization and does not work out, there's really no harm in it. That most of these guys, or at least one of these significant trade pieces, is not going to be in the playoff rotation anyway. So you're not risking that much. You could bring him in. It is worth a chance. And my full mindset is just give Nick Nurse every option, every weapon, every piece in the tool bag, every tool, every option that he could possibly need for a deep playoff run. That I do trust Nick Nurse to pull the right strings. I'm not saying Jonathan Isaac is going to be a guy that plays 25 minutes a night and the Sixers need him out there. But I do think there are certain situations, certain matchups, and certain games in which he would absolutely help this team. For that reason alone, I do think it is worth pulling the trigger on. And I think he moves the meter more than any of the previous names, with the exception of Pascal Siakam. That that is a guy that I think we would feel his presence much more. Jordan Clarkson, you could make that argument as well. But I still circle back to this concept of I want a grade A elite defender. That if, if Jonathan Isaac had no injury concerns, he was on his way to a defensive player of the year caliber player. I still believe that is in him somewhere, and I have not seen enough rust from him with him playing. Frankly, when he's been on the court, he's been good. He just has not been on the court enough. So who knows? Ultimately, we will see from here. But I do want to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments. Let me know what you think of each of those guys listed by Brett, as well as my Jonathan Isaac idea in this specific matchup. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Make sure to smash that subscribe button, hit a like on the video, and subscribe to the channel. And I'll be talking with you next time right here on Sixers Digest. Peace.